Hi, I'm Dan Barker. And I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. Welcome to Free Thought Matters, produced by the Freedom from Religion Foundation, a national association of freethinkers working to keep church and state separate. One of our favorite accomplishments last year at the Freedom from Religion Foundation was a very special public works project. We commissioned a statue of the famed civil rights attorney Clarence Darrow to go up at the site of the famous 1925 Scopes trial. The impressive statue was dedicated last July in front of the Ray County Courthouse in Dayton, Tennessee. Before we meet the statue's creator, internationally renowned sculptor Zenas Frudakis, let's take a look at the story behind the sculpture. In 1925, Dayton, Tennessee was a sleepy little southern town with a religious reputation. At the time, it was illegal in Tennessee to teach the theory of evolution in schools. Several city leaders decided to make Dayton the test case for this law, recruiting high school science teacher John Scopes as the defendant. The case attracted national attention. The famous lawyer, fervent Christian and former presidential candidate William Jennings Bryan, volunteered to help in the prosecution while the American Civil Liberties Union recruited populist firebrand Clarence Darrow to act in Scopes' defense. Held in the oppressively hot summer of 1925, the trial took on a circus atmosphere, and it brought Dayton the business and media attention it so craved. While the case was decided in favor of the prosecution, it was later overturned on a technicality. William Jennings Bryan died five days after the conclusion of the trial. In 1930, a group of Christian leaders established Bryan College in Dayton in his honor, and in 2005, a statue of Bryan was erected on the lawn of the Ray County Courthouse where the trial had taken place. The omission of a Clarence Darrow statue was finally remedied in 2017. The Freedom From Religion Foundation commissioned noted sculptor Zenos Fridakis to create a bronze likeness of Darrow, which was dedicated in a ceremony on July 14th. FFRF co-president Annie Laurie Gaylor addressed the assembled crowd. We are here, of course, to celebrate the unveiling of the missing link at the Ray County Courthouse. Clarence Darrow believed you can only protect your liberties in this world by protecting the other person's freedom. You can only be free if I am free. FFRF co-president Dan Barker quoted Clarence Darrow. An idea is a greater monument than a cathedral. So we have some monuments today for these two great men, and it's the ideas that they stood for that keep America great. We are a proudly rebellious country. We fought a revolutionary war that kicked out the sovereign, the top-down authority telling us, here's what you must think. None of us wants to be told what to think. We want to be free to think for ourselves. The great American experiment that allows all of us, no matter what our position is, to believe, to not believe, to be political or not. Clarence Darrow, William Jennings Bryan, bravo. University of Idaho Dean Andrew Kirsten is a Darrow biographer, and he pointed out that for all their differences, Darrow and Brian were still friends. Darrow and Brian at various moments were in and out of touch with American politics for most of their lives. Yet neither of them ever abandoned their basic agreement that our system of governance should work for everyone, not simply those who have more than others. Actor John DeLancey portrayed Clarence Darrow for three years in a traveling stage play. He minced no words in defining the importance of the Scopes trial and the Ray County Courthouse. But in the world of the religious versus the secular, this is ground zero, the epicenter. And now that Darrow has taken up his rightful place along with Brian, the debate can be heard by all. Sculptor Zenos Frudakis had the last word before the unveiling. Oh, I hope that you like it, and I think it's, I think it's a, um, a nice companion piece, um, and if it helps with create uh, discussion and, uh, and uh, conversation, I think that's great. While the drape hit some snags while being removed, 
Once it came off, the assembled crowd all cheered the likeness of the great lawyer, Clarence Darrow, who will share the lawn of the Ray County Courthouse with William Jennings Bryan for decades to come. Amit Paul, director of communications at the Freedom From Religion Foundation, interviewed sculptor Zenas Frudakis during FFRF's 40th annual convention last September in Madison, Wisconsin. So can we talk a bit about your most uh, acclaimed works? Uh, one of your uh, sculpture in Philadelphia, Freedom, has been named as one of the best public art works perhaps in the world. Well, I'm gratified by the response to the Freedom Sculpture because uh, a developer came to me and said, make a sculpture, and he allowed me to do what I wanted to do. And it's 20 feet long and bronze and I think eight feet high and has four figures. And I, I wanted, I thought, because I love philosophy, it's my probably my first l love, um, and I, I thought I want to do something about an idea, and the idea I picked was freedom. And, um, and I wanted to show that, I wanted to show the struggle to break free, because to show freedom, like Heraclitus said, you had to have opposites, so I wanted to show captive figure, and I wanted to show the struggle. And um, I thought that if I did something that I personally was feeling, I wanted to be free about, there were some issues that I had, um, that if, if I got very personal in my own expression, the more personal I got, and I think this is true of poetry, the more universal it will be. Because down deep we're all the same, we have the same feelings, the same fears, the same concerns. Everybody wants to be free of something. And over the years since it's been there, I think I put it in, in the year 2000, I've gotten emails, because millions of people have seen it on the internet, and I've gotten emails from people from Iran or from Sudan or from you know all over Nepal, all over the and and you know sometimes when you're getting an email from someone from let's say from a certain country that that has a theocracy or something, you know when they're saying oh I love your freedom, that they would love to be free. They're trying to say something without being arrested, uh, without and um, and then there are people who saw it. People said to me well. I, you know, I had a drug uh, problem. I went there and I looked at your sculpture, and it was inspiring, and which made me feel great. That inspired them. Um, I uh, so there was you know people wanted to get out of a bad relationship, would go and look at the sculpture. What you know they wanted to get free, and um, so that is uh, you know, to have just done that. I didn't know how people would react to it. I was taking a chance. I used traditional forms in making the sculpture, but the way I put it together, it's it's an untraditional piece. That sculpture is a mute business uh, activity uh, by its nature, and it should be. And sometimes I put words now in some of my sculptures, uh, statements, because we're so used, that's part of our, our culture and the way we see things. But I, um, it helps you see things through the language as well. But it, it, but it is something that's difficult for me sometimes to talk after I've been sculpting for a long time. It's, I have to go come into, get into another, another zone. But I wanted to do is create a sculpture that would communicate to people from different countries they didn't need to know English. And language, you know, it's an international language, and I think it crossed from. I can tell from the from all the emails I'm getting that it wasn't um, limited to you know, just Western, you know, to Europe and to America, and that it it appeals. Someone actually in India tried to copy my sculpture. Oh, so. wow, wonderful! And then other people wrote or got online. They said, "We know you didn't do it. You know, we know the freedom sculpture." And so that happens too. Sometimes you're, it's a little flattering, but it's all disconcerting when someone. Uh, does something kind of similar and says, look, I came up with this idea. <laughs> and it's interesting that you mention uh, theocracy and freedom because uh, not only do you identify yourself as a free thinker, but uh, much to uh, the Freedom From Religion Foundation's honor, you actually are a member, a dues paying well, member. So could you, could you, could you talk yes. about how you know, humanist be beliefs to. have, have uh, influenced your work over the years? Well, the honor's mine. I'm feeling just this wonderful sense of community here at the Freedom From Religion Foundation uh, at this meeting. And to be in, in this tribe, usually as a sculptor, one of the things you do as an artist is you stay away from herds and people. And D.H. Lawrence talks about that. And women love that uh, stay out away from, don't tromp off with the herd. But, um, but this is a group This is uh, that I, I feel so good uh, to be a part of. And I'm pleased to be a member. Um, I am an atheist, um, anti-theist. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to me at all, the idea of, of uh, deities, and um, it's not reasonable. I mean, and so it's, it's just wonderful to be around like-minded people in that sense. So. And, and how has... Oh, it's yeah. informed my work. Yeah, yeah the, the freedom, and I, um, I have sculpted uh, one archbishop, and I mean, sometimes the people you sculpt are not going to be all, you know, I don't check, say, are you an atheist, and are you agnostic, and... Um, I would try not to do a sculpture. I think it would be difficult for me to do a sculpture that would promote uh, religion 
at this point, even for a lot of money, I think it would be difficult. Somebody should try testing me on that, but I don't think I would do it. I've done a lot of sculptures of, uh, that, that were important to me because they were socially conscious, they were the head of an agenda, I have a progressive political agenda. I think that an artist today, not just a sculptor, but painters, poets, uh, musicians, songwriters, have a responsibility to, at least for some of their work, to say something to try to improve the situation in the world because I think the world is in the dire straits. You know, we've got a, an insane president uh, and surrounded by people who are uh, religious zealots, global warming and, and, you know, climate change. We've got uh, the North Korea situation. Um, so it's, it's a scary time and artists have, have a responsibility not to just sit quietly. I think they need to speak up. Everybody needs to do something. And there are a lot of, in, for, it became popular, I think, in the 50s, 60s, some 70s, for artists to say, well, I'm doing art for art's sake. It's not going to make a statement. I don't agree with that. I mean, you can do it if you want to be that person. It's just you're, you're being the person who is not voting, okay. basically. And we see how that worked out. So for those artists who don't dance or, um, you know, create songs and, and whatever that aren't, I think, you know, it, it was, there was a time in the 30s when there was social realism. And it, it became somewhat discredited because the Russians had their version sure. and, the, and the Americans didn't want it to look like we had, because a lot of the artists were communists probably in the 30s because yeah. it, it was an idealistic thing for them. They didn't know the realities of Stalin at that point. But that doesn't mean it shouldn't have stopped, he, that it should have stopped here. And there, there are stories and you can read in, in the, recently in the newspapers that the CIA wanted, were, su were supporting art that wasn't figurative because sure, they yes. didn't want People, they didn't want that statement. And there were people like Nelson Rockefeller who were, uh, there was a film made about this recently, that he didn't, because he didn't like Diego Rivera did a, sculpt, a painting that criticized the wealthy, like himself, so that he put his backing behind art that didn't represent anything that would make a statement that would attack the rich. And uh, so I think it's important to, uh, to, to, to have something to say. Otherwise, why are you doing art? Sure. Just uh, do something decorative and make ornaments. I mean, that's okay too in its place, but uh, again, you're, you're sitting on, on, on uh, if you don't say something, by omission, you're, 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 you're part of the problem, you're, you're reinforcing it. And that's why you're here in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, because there's been over the past year a congruence yes. of belief or non-belief between yes. uh, you and uh, FFRF that uh, you have uh, really been amazingly uh, helpful in two projects. One is the restoration of the Robert Ingersoll statue, and the other is uh, creating a Clarence Darrow statue from scratch. Um, and of course, you know, that's, uh, Darrow is known uh, for being a free thinker and a yes, lawyer. Agnostic. And, uh, agnostic. <clears throat> and, I think uh, he wrote something that said, you know, I'm an agnostic. And, and very uh, famously, he uh, sort of, you know, uh, fought the Scopes trial yes. uh, for uh, the right of a teacher to teach evolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was in Tennessee. And the statue now stands at the site of the trial, immortalized in the play and the movie Inherit the Wind. Can you talk about that and how you came about uh, sort of, you know, creating the statue and what's the significance? Well, when I was in seventh grade in, in, in Gary, Indiana, I was in a senior class play. I was one of the, everybody else was pretty much a senior. And um, I had a part where I, if the, you don't see it in the movie. This was cut out of the movie with Spencer Tracy where I waved a, a worm in front of a little girl to, you know, boys did that to kind of impress girls they liked, that kind of thing. And I said, you was a worm once. And, um, and then she, you know, she said, no, I wasn't. And I said, yes, you were. And you came from a lower form of animals. And, and then she got scared and upset and went home and told her parents. And presumably then they got John Scopes uh, arrested. It's not, of course, how it happened. What happened in Dayton, Tennessee is that they, because William Jennings Bryan encouraged Tennessee and other states to pass laws against teaching evolution, because um, he was a creationist of sorts, um, they, they passed the law. And, um, and, the, and Dayton, Tennessee, wanted to bring publicity to the town. They were having an economic problem and they wanted to fill their hotel. I don't know if they had more than one and some of their restaurants. And it's a very small town and kind of away from Nashville and the other larger cities. They planned, uh, they had John Scopes come in and they said, you're not married, it won't bother you that much if we make you be the scapegoat in this. And, and he went along and they arrested him and uh, they all knew him, they were all. And, um, and uh, went to trial and then they were surprised because William James Bryan said, oh, well, I'll come and prosecute him. 
and William James Bryan was the, one of the most important speakers at the time. Certainly. And he had run for president three times and lost. He'd been the Secretary of uh, War under Woodrow Wilson. And when he did that, then Clarence Darrow, who was a little annoyed at that point with, with William James Bryan, who he had, he had supported earlier for his presidential bid, because he didn't like this creationism um, influence that he had. He said, I'll come to Dayton and I'll defend John Scopes. So now you had the two titans uh, who were who were going to go to war in this little town. And people kind of forgot about John Scopes. Poor Scopes got pushed to the side. It became really theater. And it was the first time that uh, I think there was national radio. Uh, WGN from Chicago came and set up. And so people could hear it all over the country. There were a lot of photographers and reporters. And I got to use some of those photos to create the sculpture. But I read that there was not a, a uh, Clarence Darrow sculpture there. There was only one of William James Bryan. And I felt that wasn't fair. They were both there. And I certainly thought that why did they put up a sculpture of the person who was promoting this this mythology of creationism and um, and not one of science and reason which Darrell was so I was waiting for the opportunity and um, at uh, several people had mentioned to me that there should be a, a sculpture there and uh, and somebody from the town a historian there also at the time that they put up the Bryan sculpture said no well now there needs to be a Darrell one and so I uh, I started working on it and uh, Margaret Downey, who was a friend of mine, took me to a meeting in Philadelphia at the Ethics Society in, I think it was 2015, a couple of years before I uh, finished the sculpture, and uh, to meet uh, Annie Laurie she, uh, Gaylor. She was speaking, and uh, Margaret said, I think that perhaps she could help you with this project. And, and I went, and we sat together, had some dinner with other people, and I mentioned my idea. And she said, I think I can be supportive. The Freedom from Religion Foundation is interested in that because we sued the town of Dayton because the Bryan College, this biblical college that was set up after Bryan died, because he died five days after the trial, they, um, they've been sending preachers, people over to the public schools, not the private schools, public schools to, to preach religion, to teach religion. And we stopped them. And so this would be a continuation of that, in a sense, because now they're sending, they've sent the bronze sculpture that's a, of a preacher, basically. Uh, William James Bryan was preaching. And, uh, and it's on public property, on county land. And um, so she wanted to be helpful with that. And she had her own project of the Ingersoll sculpture, which I helped her, directed her to a foundry, and I supervised, needed some fixing, some little patching. And we, once we installed that, then she contributed to the to the project of the uh, Clarence Darrell. And I got it to a certain point, and then I didn't have any more money to move forward with it, and we couldn't get it cast in bronze. And, and, and she asked, she called me one day, she said, well, how's the sculpture going? And I said, well, I don't have money to, to cast it in bronze. It's an expensive process. We weren't able to raise other money. And she said, well, what do you need? I think the foundation will, will uh, help you with that. So they came to my rescue. They, we now, because I'm a member. But um, if it wasn't for the Freedom of Religion Foundation, the sculpture would still be sitting in my studio, keeping me company, talking to me, and telling me about these legal battles. So um, that's what made the difference. Um, and you were down there for the uh, unveiling of the statue, too. Well, that was, that was interesting, because there was uh, one of the zealots from Dayton, Tennessee, a, a woman that actually had been on the John Stewart show, the Daily Show, years before, where they wanted to show her because she was such an uh, eccentric individual. She um, went public, and, and, and there were pictures on her Facebook, and she went on television and newspapers saying that if I tried to put the sculpture up, she, she'd have a nice surprise for me. And there were pictures of her with a shotgun. Not a Bible. She was supposed to be some kind of pastor, but she had a, a shotgun. I went anyway. Um, I... Uh, Years, it, may, it reminded me, years before I had done a sculpture of Martin Luther King during apartheid uh, period in South Africa, and the American Embassy had asked me to do a sculpture, and they snuck it over in a diplomatic pouch, and then they said, you'll go over and unveil it uh, if you want, but you might get arrested, and if you get arrested, we'll try to get you out of jail. It gave me that scare. Right. I got that, I felt that again, that kind of concern. I didn't get arrested, but um, in this case, I didn't, I didn't get shot. Uh, what I found out was, was very interesting. Um, there were several times when the project almost fell through, but the historian, who I found out the last day when I unveiled the sculpture, was actually a Christian and a creationist. That's incredible. He, yes, he wanted that sculpture to go up there, and he helped, because he was a historian, too, and he thought, this is part of the story. This is, um, you know, it's not complete without him there. And I wanted it there because I wanted to take it away from being a, a preachy piece there by itself with the, with the uh, Brian, and by putting the sculpture of Darrow there, it would become, I'd reappropriate it as a historical narrative. And... Uh, 
it would lose that that significance as a as a um, the Brian would as a polemicist for religion. There were people in town who kept uh, the the zealots away. They told him you're not, and the state police went to her house and told you're not going to the unveiling. I was concerned about that, not just for my own safety, but for other people. And then I thought they might shoot the sculpture. Maybe she threatened to spray paint it. So I don't know. That hasn't happened yet, as far as I know. And the, and the county should be appreciative because this is what the county is known for. This is yes. a tourist. This is a tourist attraction, and by having that sculpture there of Darrow, you're adding so much and enhancing the site, uh, the, the courthouse so much. And I told them that when I got up to speak, I said this should be good for the original purpose of having a trial. I mean, it reinforces that. Hopefully, you'll have more tourism. You'll have more people in the hotels. you have more people in the restaurants. I went there to look at the site before my sculpture was there. When I went to my car to leave, I saw a group of students come and look at the Brian, and, and then they were leaving. And so I jumped out of the car and I ran across this courthouse lawn, this uh, property, and stopped them and said, wait, there's more to the story. You only heard the Brian story. That sculpture spoke to you, but there's another sculpture here that will speak to you. And the teacher, who was from Atlanta with her high school class, said, well, can you tell us about it? And I said, I'm, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I was hoping sure, you would. And I thought, this is what the sculpture is going to do. You know, I, I, I wanted the sculpt. I didn't want to sit in my car for the rest of my life in the parking lot and jump out every time I saw students and run across the lawn and, and tell them, you know, what, what you don't know about Clarence Darrow. But the sculpture would do that for me, and it wouldn't tire. It would, it would be unfailing in talking about, you know, its presence, its historical significance. Well, that's, that's wonderful. And yes, from what uh, I've heard otherwise also that uh, the whole unveiling ceremony went well. It, it got a wonderful amount of media. It did, except too. for the taking the cloth off yes. of it. It got stuck on it's his like little stuck. hair. And, uh, and that was, you know, it, was, it took about five minutes. And uh, anticipate people kept waiting. It just took off a little bit of cloth at a time. We finally got it. We were, you know, people were pulling from different angles. Everybody wanted to get in on, there were, I think, four people who wanted to unveil it. And there should be really one person. You pull it from one side. So they're pulling against each other. And then I was pulling a little bit, and somebody else was pull it on the other side. And I told the, uh, the group there that this is taking longer to unveil than it did to sculpt it. But um, it uh, finally got unveiled, and it's there now, and I've heard good things, and it, when I've, it hasn't been um, desecrated in any way. There were enough reasonable people in town, much more than the person who was loud, who squeaked the loudest, this zealot, and a few other people around her. Most of the people did not want to be associated with that. They did not want the shame or humiliation of being looked at as a hick town or something, because they're not. And, um, and I think they felt good about it once it went up, and, and um, I hope so. Because I didn't want to force it on them, but I thought I wanted them to have the option to talk about, because this is, this is the accurate thing. It's the historically true thing to have Darrow there talking about the historically true event of evolution. And so that was the other part of this. The Bryan sculpture, is uh, too young. It's not from that period. They want him to look good. He was actually overweight, balding, five days from dying at the end of the trial, um, looking as bad as you'd ever look in his life. And, but they didn't want him to look like that because they wanted to have this pretty picture of him and just like they prettied up this, this idea of creationism, which, you know, there was a falsehood to both. So it's important to me because I wanted to show the credible history of evolution, I wanted uh, Darrow to be the right age. He was 68, and Brian was 65, and he was rough, he, he slept in his suits, and he was a little overweight, and he had a little belly, and he had uh, his little balding a little bit. I didn't want to have a false note in it, because I wanted to show that evolution is the credible choice. Um, the other part I was going to, you know, I was asked from the beginning, don't overwhelm. The, the town asked me, you can do this sculpture, but don't, don't overwhelm Brian. We don't want you coming here and making something bigger and, and more impressive. So I stayed within the letter of that law that they laid down. Um, the whole sculpture with the base that, of Brian is 10 feet high. And um, so, but it's a six foot sculpture at a four foot base. And outdoors, sculpture should be at least seven feet high. They should be a little over life size because they air eats them up. They look smaller than life if they're life size. And I want it to be a little bit bigger than, than the Brian. So I made my Daryl seven feet high, and the base is three feet. So overall, it's 10 feet. So I could say to them truthfully, it's 10 feet high, just like the other one. And they look, you know, you see them next, you know, they're, they're, they're on either side of the courthouse. 
where this trial took place, they look like they're about the same height, but the, the, I, th I dare say the Daryl looks a little bit more imposing. He's a little <laughs> larger. Um, and also, again, uh, I made a, I, the other one has a concrete base, which I don't think concrete is not a very attractive material, and it, it uh, ages poorly. And I have a nice granite base, so that was another way that I wanted to. Uh, and I also made my, uh, my sculpture look, uh, I gave it a green patina, so it looked like it had aged, so it had been there as long as the Daryl. Sure. And, uh, and the base, the granite base has uh, a warm brown stone that, that mimics and rhymes visually with the building behind it, which the concrete doesn't have anything to do with the building. And the base of the, there's another base under the base, a small section that looks like the building, bottom of the base is kind of a rougher stone. But in any case, what I wanted to show is an affinity between him and the courthouse that it's again in art and called kind of a visual rhyme. And what I was creating with the sculpture was a visual biography. You know, I met one biographer there who spoke, and I read several biographies of him. And uh, so that, in a sense, was what I was doing. But a biography with a message, with a kind of philosophical statement. And yeah, and you seem to have succeeded. It's, uh, I have just seen pictures. I haven't been down there, but it seems like an uh, incredible uh, uh, work. And I would encourage uh, sure. our members, too, who are in the area to make a detour to the County Courthouse, uh, the site you. of the Scopes trial, and, and, to, and to take a look at it. Well, you know, the interesting thing now, in the past, you'd have to go to the location to see a sculpture. Now, of course, because of the internet, of it'll, it is being seen much more, has been seen much more online than in, sure. in person. And it's true of my freedom sculpture, too. Um, you know, it's, so that in a way, it, it exists in Tennessee, where the Scopes trial took place, which is thrilled to me because I love history, and it's part of history. And it's reshaping the history that they were trying to redefine down there with just a preachy piece. But it's also, it exists even more on the internet. Certainly, certainly. So it's got this, this uh, kind of doubled uh, ex existence. So that's, that's interesting because that's changed you know, in, in, in our time. Thank Amit Paul for guest hosting Free Thought Matters today, and we invite you to tune in next week because Free Thought Matters. Mm -hmm.